Uh, good. So people are starting to trickle in. Excellent. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar, How is SLS 3D Printing Being Used in Orthotics? My name is Madeline Pryor, and as always, I am the moderator for the webinar today. I am also being joined by my two panelists, Lee Babias from Hardways and Gilles Dernay from Access Prototypes Inc. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Hello. Oh, happy to be here. It's great to have you. So just so you know, I will actually introduce myself and the panelists in a little bit. But while we are just getting started and people are still trickling in, I did want to take the opportunity to share a quick poll with you all. Um, it's just to get a general idea of what uh, your expectations for are for the webinar, as well as you know, who is attending today. Uh, it should have popped up on your screen. If you could just take a quick look and answer that, that would be fantastic. I'll leave it up for a few, a couple of minutes while everyone is just answering and uh, joining the webinar. Um, but while you're doing that, and please do let me know if you don't see it for some reason on the screen, uh, we, well, I'll just do some basic housekeeping things. Uh, just so you know, at the bottom of the screen, you will see a Q&A button. This Q&A button can be uh, used to ask questions, of course. Since there will be a Q&A session at the end of uh, this webinar in the last 15 minutes or so, I do highly recommend that you ask your questions. Please do ask them there. If you ask them in the chat, they do risk being lost. It has happened before when lots of people are talking that I just do not see them, whereas if they're in the Q&A section, I will absolutely see them. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Uh, and yeah, basically that this webinar is actually being recorded, but it will not be available except through Podways later on. Uh, keep that in mind. Um, please don't raise your hand. And yeah, so let's just have a few more people voting. It's been about a minute. Uh, you can just answer the questions. They're very quick, just so we can understand a little bit more about your expectations. And I will start in a second. Um, but okay, I will end the poll and you can see uh, the results right here. There are actually, oh, well, that was my bad. Share results, no? Okay, well, it was very interesting because actually what happened was that most of you are working in the field of AM, which is very interesting. And uh, I'm looking forward to what else happens today. Um, and we are definitely recording. Okay, great. So let's get into it. If we could just move on to the next slide. So as I mentioned, I uh, will be introducing you to the webinar. As you can see, after this survey and introduction, we will actually be going straight into the question, why should you be using 3D printing and especially SLS 3D printing for the production of orthotics? After that, we will take a closer look at a case study from Access Prototyping and Podways, which is an actual orthotic that has been created. So you can see how it can be used and what the benefits are of using the technology. And then as previously mentioned, we will be ending with the Q&A section. Don't be shy, please do ask your questions in the section, which is on the bottom of your screen. Uh, next slide. So my name, as I mentioned, is Madeline Pryor. I am an English content specialist for 3D Natives, which is the largest international online media platform on 3D printing and which is available in five languages. Uh, I always make the same joke, but English, of course, as you can tell, as well as French, German, Spanish, and Italian. So if you speak one of those languages, feel free to check us out in them or in English. Uh, we have a monthly webinar as well, if you are interested. I will be, as I mentioned, the moderator of the panel and especially of the Q&A. Uh, again, please do ask questions at the bottom. And let's now move on to my wonderful panelists who I'm excited to greet today. So first we have Liba Bi uh, sorry, Lee, that was in French, <laughs> Lee, yes, who was a regional manager for Prodways Tech 
He has several years of experience in 3D printing and additive manufacturing. He's aided numerous customers in their deployment of 3D printing across several applications. For those of you who for some reason are not that well versed up on Podways, Podways Tech is a specialist in industrial and professional 3D printing, providing a wide range of multi-technology 3D printers and premium materials. With its range of SLS 3D printers in particular, Podways offers entry-level industrial machines which are perfectly adapted to start with SLS production of parts or to extend production capacity to new materials, including PP and TPU. Next up, we have Gilles Dernay, who is the CEO of Axis Prototypes, Inc. He has over 20 years of experience in the 3D printing industry and provides a strategic perspective on the uses and development of rapid prototyping, manufacturing and 3D printing applications and technology. He is also certified by the SME, the Society of Manufacturing Engineers, in rapid technologies and additive manufacturing at the master level. And his company, Axis Prototype, sorry, is the Canadian pioneer in rapid prototyping services and additive manufacturing technologies. They have an expertise in 3D design, 3D scanning for reverse engineering, and part to CAD comparison. And now let's get into the topic. Uh, if we could just move to the next slide as well. Uh, well, as you'll expect, today we'll be talking especially about orthotics and their creation with SLS 3D printing. I just wanted to show you a quick look at the prosthetics and orthotics market as a whole. These are actually statistics from North America. This market, as you can see, is growing actually quite fast. Um, there's about a 4.2% market CAGR, which is expected from 2021 to 2028. And the bulk of that is in orthotics. People like to talk about prosthetics. But when we actually talk about healthcare and especially personalized healthcare, orthotics plays a very large role and we'll explain a little why as well as why they're important later on. Um, on to the next slide, please. And as you can expect, 3D printing is increasingly playing a role in the creation of this. Uh, from In this graph, you can see from 2014, when 3DP penetration was only about 0.6%. It has already ra raised rapidly um, in 2021, 12.1, and it's expected to grow even more in 2027 to 35.2%. If you're well-versed in 3D printing and healthcare, this might make sense because it's well-known for the ability to fully customize, personalize, and create lightweight parts exactly to your patient, which is very important, especially when we're talking about something like this. Um, and next slide, please. And out of those, well, it is growing rapidly. And as you can see, actually SLS or specific laser sintering, which is one of the terms, is one of the main technologies that's being used for this. These actually don't just take into account orthotics and prosthetics. You can see the other technologies which are also used, especially SLA, which is very used in dentistry. But SLS is becoming increasingly important and we're very excited to introduce the topic to you today about why you can use it and how for orthotics. Uh, next slide, please. So that is it for me. So we'll go straight into why you would use 3D printing for orthotics. And gentlemen, I will let you take it away. Once again, welcome. And uh, let's get started. Excellent, thank you, Madeline. Uh, so, so what are orthotics? Um, I, I think it is important that we, we first address what exactly an orthotic is before we get going here. Uh, I'm sure many of you are within the industry or currently have them in your shoes right now. Um, but for those of you that aren't aware, uh, when we speak about orthotics, we are talking about the insoles that are custom made uh, to treat a wide variety of issues. Um, they are a prescribed medical appliance that can be used to correct the issues with how you walk, how you stand, or how you run. Um, and they are also uh, able to alleviate pain caused by other medical conditions. I know I've had them in the past, and I'm sure uh, many of you know others with them as well. So it is a very commonly used product. Um, the final part is regulated, uh, is, it is a regulated product, but the printed portion, um, the plastic piece itself is not a regulated product. And uh, just a, a quick observation on this slide as well. Uh, you may see uh, some examples of the printed parts on the right hand side of the slide. Um, so I know this, uh, this webinar is being broadcast to an international audience. 
but there, there seems to be a difference in the way that orthotics are designed uh, here in North America versus how they are in Europe. Uh, the 3D printed parts that you see on the right uh, show the North American model, which is the, uh, the solid part uh, versus the, the European part, which does have some holes within it. Um, it's just a different way of producing the part, but I wanted to point this out as I know some of our, my American customers have had questions about this in the past. Um, so with that, I will kick it over to Jills to talk about some of the, uh, the methods for producing uh, currently. Yeah, thank you, Lee. <clears throat> so um, currently, uh, the parts are, uh, well, currently orthotics are done uh, in a mostly manual process uh, through either uh, a fo uh, the foot is molded and then they, uh, the um, laboratory will use a, will create a plaster mold and cast the part in plastic. Um, others will machine the mold uh, through using CNC uh, and one of the big challenges that we're facing or that's that's happening is that this is a very manual process and the uh, quality of the result depends on the labor that is associated to it um, and the other challenge that we're seeing is that uh, especially in North America the professionals that do those orthotics are um, are getting older and they are retiring and there is not a workforce that is coming up to replace them so uh, we are starting to see a challenge in the labor in the industry to be able to provide those services. So the idea of going to uh, mass cust uh, to customize manufacturing using 3D printing comes in to be able to uh, allow um, the capability of the industry to be able to survive and to be able to uh, provide the service in the future. Um, so Lee, you can take it on. Yep. So. So let's uh, let's talk about some of the reasons, <clears throat> excuse me, that the orthotics industry has taken to 3D printing over recent years. Um, so the first question I want to address is is why 3D print at all, and and then we can get into why SLS printing is the most effective method for producing orthotics. Um, so in my opinion, the first the first question is an easy one. Uh, it's the same reason that many other industries rely on 3D printing. Um, the ability to mass customize parts on demand and easily scale is very important in every industry. Um, SLS printing is just the most effective 3D printing uh, technology to create orthotics. And again, when, we, when, we, when I say SLS, I just want to be clear, we're talking about selective laser sintering, uh, which is a powder bed technology. You can see uh, an example of what the, uh, what the machine uh, the, the internals of the machine looks like up in the top right hand corner there. Um, so SLS printing produces functional parts, which other technologies such as FDM or SLA technologies are, are not as great for. Um, they do produce parts that, that look great, but often they can't be used uh, functionally. Um, and then the materials used within SLS printing are durable materials, and many of them are already commonly used within the industry, such as polypropylene. Uh, there can be more surface roughness than you would get off of uh, some of these other technologies, but post-processing has come a long ways in recent years. Um, companies like uh, we, we, we've done some work with AMT and Dimension, um, they have created post-processing techniques that make SLS parts virtually indifferent from uh, traditional methods. Um, so now that we've addressed the technology itself, uh, we can talk about some of the, the more intricate uh, advantages of producing with 3D printing instead of traditional methods. Um, so the first really comes down to consistency and accuracy. Um, I will agree that there has been an art to manufacturing of orthotics historically, but switching to 3D printing uh, eliminates much of the room for error in production. Uh, what you input into the machine is what will be spit out. The accuracy uh, and consistency cannot be topped by traditional methods. Uh, there is also the potential to lower cost over time. The current process is labor intensive, which we all know needs to be accounted for in the cost of the part. Uh, with 3D printing, this is eliminated. The materials used today, polypropylene, uh, nylons, TPU, they are not overly expensive materials. And all of these materials offer some sort of recyclability, meaning that each build can be launched with a mixture of new and used powder. 
Um, 3D printing orthotics also allows you to produce numerous parts at a single time. Uh, the density at which you nest or orientate these parts will determine the number of parts you can print, uh, print in a single build. But even with uh, conservative nesting density, you are able to pack a large number of orthotics into a single build. Um, so, and then we, we'll talk about the materials. So we'll, we'll dive into the materials uh, more in depth a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but the materials currently available in SLS printing allow you to produce parts that are very similar to what is produced with traditional methods today. Um, and then you also have access to elastomeric materials like TPU um, to open up even more doors uh, for treatment. And then finally, uh, the ability to lower a skin to production time. Uh, so when the process is uh, digitalized, we can move into production at a much quicker pace. Uh, with the sophomore programs available today, uh, you can now scan, uh, make your adjustments, and then get right, right to printing, um, saving a great amount of time. And then I know I'll, I'll kick it over to Jill to take you more through this uh, this digital workflow. Thanks. So the, um, the the success or the potential success for this uh, this technology really relies on the fact that. Um, the tools are now being created and they're now becoming commercially available to be able to um, take the, um, the information from this, the patient specific information all the way to a final product. Uh, and that is integrated into a digital workflow. Uh, so that digital workflow starts with a digital scan of the patient, uh, where essentially there's a number of tools that are now available to be able to do a full uh, scan of the foot. Uh, whether it's a uh, specialized scanners that are dedicated for uh, for foot uh, impressions, or um, there are also iPad solutions. So essentially, uh, you can take a, a custom off-the-shelf uh, iPad and use it to be able to uh, measure the patient foot, to scan the patient foot, and then afterwards take your data points, which are then being able to uh, feed into the solution. So you can create a customized um, drawing or you can have the customized uh, patient data uh, directly in, in digital and then that goes to the second step where essentially uh, it's being fed into the CAD or design software. So these data points and the, the information from the scan is then being used by a software to be able to create the orthotics. So uh, some of the solutions available right now, Fitfoot360, uh, which is a UK-based company which uh, essentially will do the creation. There's also a Canadian company called OrthoMesh that uh, um, has a solution and there are probably others also on the market. So from this design uh, step, so essentially this is where the, the expertise goes in, uh, where the, um, the, 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 uh, the the prescription that is required for the for the, uh, the so the data from the pa the patient with the prescription uh, from the uh, doctor or from the uh, uh, specialist is being integrated into the design of the part, and from there they comes out the, um, the the design of the plastic part that will then have to be three D printed. So then that and, and that file comes out in the form of an STL, uh, which is then transferred to uh, the printer to be able to be 3D printed. So the parts are then nested into a, uh, a build uh, and sent to the printer and that's what uh, and out of it will come out the uh, plastic insert uh, that you see in the fourth, uh, fourth step of this process. Now that plastic insert coming out of the machine uh, is a little bit rough on the surface because uh, it's SLS printing so you do have a bit of surface so you can easily be uh, sanded using sandblasting or even sanding paper, uh, or we can use a more automated uh, process such as uh, Dimension or uh, uh, AMT to be able to do a mechanical finishing or even a, uh, a chemical uh, finishing of the surface, and then that gives a smooth part. And then afterwards, the lab will take these, uh, these plastic inserts that are finished and we'll apply um, things to uh, finalize the product to the, to the prescription that is required. So they will put the skin onto the part, they will uh, add uh, certain uh, uh, plastic inserts or whatever as necessary to provide the final, uh, the final orthotic that is the uh, product that is sent and given to the customer. Next. 
So we can do a quick case study. So as you can see here, we have uh, an image of a uh, uh, of a build uh, that is uh, that integrates about uh, 30 pairs or 60 pieces of orthotics inside a build. Uh, they can be layered in, into uh, the, the build to be able to, uh, to to run the machine. So this is a typical uh, workflow that we have. Uh, we do work with labs here in Canada uh, uh, that are currently uh, 3D printing orthotics through our uh, service bureau. So essentially they take uh, their patient scans during the week and then they will do the diagnostic and uh, develop the treatment. Um, and using the, uh, the CAD software will input um, their, uh, will take the input of the scan and then design uh, the required orthotic to meet the, uh, the needs of the customer. Uh, that is then sent to us on a regular basis. Um, Right now, uh, for example, we get that on Sunday evening from the uh, from our customer, uh, and then on Monday, what we do is we'll then uh, take the parts, uh, integrate them into the uh, uh, into a build, as you could see in the previous slide, uh, and then they are launched on the uh, machine and uh, on the SLS machine, so they can be uh, uh, they build overnight, and then they will be post processed and finished and then shipped to the laboratory uh, so that they can then assemble to it uh, the final uh, elements and ship to the customer. So the whole process takes about three to five business days to, uh, to go from, uh, from the scan or from the uh, rece reception of the, uh, the design all the way to the, the parts being received by the lab uh, finished from us. Next. So we have so we have three uh, materials that we work with right now. So we work with nylon, um, that is uh, uh, what I would say the uh, the most common use uh, commonly used uh, material in the area of three D uh, SLS right now. Uh, that was the uh, that's the material that launched SLS twenty five years ago. So uh, still very widely used. Uh, but over um, over the last few years, we've seen the uh, the coming of polypropylene. Uh, into the area of uh, SLS. So it's a relatively new material for the field of SLS uh, and Prodways has been pioneering that, uh, that material. Um, so the beauty of the PolyPro is the fact that it is the current material that is mostly used for orthotics. So uh, it allows the uh, specialists, uh, uh, the laboratories to work with a material that is known using standard practices uh, and the other thing is uh, because polypropylene can be sanded down a lot fa a lot easier than nylon, uh, it allows for last minute adjustments and uh, uh, corrections in the field by the, by the uh, end user, uh, which nylon is a little bit more difficult to do. Uh, and lastly, we do have TPU that is being used in certain applications for orthotics. Uh, that is when you need more a, a cushiony kind of uh, uh, application. Uh, you can use TPU with uh, various um, uh, fill uh, level to be able to adapt the, uh, the, 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 the uh, strain or the, uh, the support that is being provided to the end user. So those are the materials that are available right now. And Jill, it's just to add on your uh, your polypropylene point, I mean obviously you know you mentioned that it's the, the common material used right now. But uh, as far as SLS printing goes, I mean, it's the, the cost of the material and the recyclability of the material is, is better than you get from a nylon uh, as well. So, I mean, you're talking about lowering your cost per part. There's two ways you can do it right off the bat. Just, I mean, obviously the lower cost of the material and then the recyclability, it's, it's huge. It's so it's a big reason that what we think that the, uh, the polypropylene material is uh, gonna be a, a huge success for the orthotics industry. So I just wanted to point that out as well. Good point. Yeah. Uh, next slide. So we um, so typically this is a build, uh, a full, uh, a complete build that we can do. Um, so if we get 30, uh, 30 pairs of orthotics, uh, we can nestle them. Uh, naturally, the the nesting will depend on the size of the orthotics. So if we if we have more kids uh, orthotics and less, uh, you know giant adults, uh, you know, size, uh, size 14 feet, 
Um, you know, it can change the packing or, or the, uh, the amount of orthotics we can fit in, but uh, in, in general build, we will fill, fit about um, 30, uh, 30 pairs. So the parts are nested um, inside a software uh, like Magix or um, a nesting software. Um, and then essentially uh, we, keep, we do have to put a bit of spacing between the parts to uh, manage the, uh, the dynamics, the heating dynamics of the machine. Uh, and then that is uh, uh, being able to, uh, to be put into the machine. So once we launch that, the machine will be building for 16, 18 hours. Next slide. Uh, Luke. I'm on mute. You'd think I'd be used to doing this by now. Sorry. Um, so at Broadways, uh, we offer two different SLS machines. So you'll see there that we have them highlighted. We have our P1000X and our P1000S. Um, these machines offer, you know, it's, it's, so it's an industrial machine at the lowest cost to volume ratio uh, on the market. Um, the only difference in these two machines is the, the laser power. So a good way to, to look at the difference in these two machines is on the P1000X, if we're talking about a, a full build of orthotics, you're, you're launching a job on a daily basis, on, or you're able to launch a job on a daily basis. On the S, you're able to launch a job more on a, uh, I'd say, every other day basis. So it all comes down to the volumes that you're uh, producing and, and what makes sense for, for your business. Um, so we do also offer the ability to easily switch uh, between materials on our machine. So we've talked a lot about uh, printing in polypropylene, but you know, say you have a customer that uh, is uh, demanding a, a PA11 part. It is very easy to switch from uh, the polypropylene material to the PA11 for your next build. Um, and then we can also talk about the reliability. I mean, SLS is a proven technology. Probably we have been making these machines for a number of years. So the, uh, the, they are a reliable machine. Um, and then finally, the affordability, um, you know, enables our customers to, uh, you know, I mean, really, if you wanted to, you could get two of these machines for the price of uh, one of our competitors' machines, um, allowing for some, some redundancy. So as, as we all know, it's, I mean, it's a proven technology, they're reliable, but it's machinery. Things happen. Um, if, if something does happen, you are not fully down. Uh, if you are, if you do have two machines versus having one of the, uh, the competitor machines. Uh, next slide. So we can talk about the, uh, the high capacity production. So Jill's mentioned the, uh, the number of parts that you're able to to fit into a, a single build. Uh, so he does this on a daily basis. So these are, these are real numbers. Um, but you know, with, a, with a standard nesting density on the Broadway's machines, you're able to produce uh, 20 to 30 pairs of orthotics in a single run. Again, this comes down to some of the things that Jill's mentioned, such as the, uh, you know, if you're making them for kids or, or people, you know, uh, large adults. Um, the build envelope on our machines are it's 300 by 300 by 360 millimeters, and the machine is able to run unattended. So you are still producing even while you sleep. Um, and to take things even further, there are now many options on the market for automated post-processing, uh, where you can do the depowdering and blasting within the same unit. Uh, so next slide, please. And then the, uh, the, the final uh, advantage we wanted to, to discuss here, um, or the last advantage of working with a company such as Broadways is the, uh, the openness of our system. So this is really something that I would say has been uh, you know, built into the DNA of our company. I mean, Broadways, we've, we've always uh, you know, had an open system. Uh, we do not like to lock our customers in. I know our customers don't like to feel like they're locked in to, uh, to what they're using. So um, this has been a big part of, of what we offer at Broadway. So we do offer flexibility on the software and scanning solutions that can work with our machines. Uh, so the machines are open. We can work with any of these programs. Um, 
but this really allows you to keep up with the, you know, the technological advancements in the industry. It's software. Um, it's constantly changing. Uh, there's always something better coming out. Uh, if something does replace, uh, you know, what is standard in the industry now, it, you do have the ability to make that change and, and still keep your machine and, and keep producing with with uh, the Prodways machines. Um, so, in the, and then beyond that, our users also have access to many of the parameters um, to make adjustments on the machine as well, um, as far as temperature and other parameters. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, your our flexibility is extended uh, to our materials as well. I mentioned this before, uh, but it is very easy to switch between the materials. Uh, we do not charge you for the parameter sets to switch between our materials. So uh, when you get a produce machine, you do have access to the parameters uh, to create parts in, in polypropylene, TPU, and the, uh, the nylons as well. So next slide. So we um, so we worked up a um, so this is pretty much uh, information from our uh, our experience in running with the uh, with the machine and with the uh, materials that we have. Um, we are constantly uh, monitoring to make sure that we can uh, improve on the on the phys on the uh, financial performance. Uh, but you know th these are numbers that we are get we are achieving as we speak right now. Um, the I guess polypropylene is what we produce the most right now. Um, so the material cost on a per part basis is somewhere between 550 and 725 US per part. Um, that is that includes not only the uh, polypropylene that is in the parts, but also any excess that uh, would not be uh, recycled in the process. Um, currently, we are working mostly in a manual process, so we don't have the dimension uh, in our facility. We don't have the dimension or the M uh, AMG uh, equipment to do the processing or the post processing. Uh, they are coming later, but uh, at this point, we do the uh, processing by hand. So, if we look at the labor component, that is the programming, the uh, the nesting of the parts, and then the uh, sandblasting and the cleaning and uh, depowdering of the parts. Uh, we calculate about five dollars per part uh, of labor that we have in there. Uh, if we look at the investment in the machine, the, uh, the capital cost of the machine plus a maintenance contract, now depending upon the number of builds that are done per week, um, and we're assuming that we get like 30 pairs per build, uh, on a five builds per week, we'd be looking at about $3.25 uh, per part uh, for the uh, depreciation of the machine over a five-year period, in addition to the uh, maintenance contract that is required to uh, uh, to keep the machine uh, in a good functioning uh, order. So when we all add that up, uh, next slide, um, we're able to reach, um, you know, if you're using a ProMaker X, uh, 1000X, uh, doing five builds per week using polypropylene and about 30 pairs per job. So our yearly volume of about 7,800 pairs, uh, we come out to a total cost of about 2850 uh, per pair. And um, we, we benchmark against um, other, uh, other technologies and uh, uh, salespeople. Um, they're, they're usually uh, talking about somewhere in the $50 to $75 uh, range for pair. So we feel that the, the solution that we have is quite effective uh, and uh, is competitive with respect to uh, what's available out there. Uh, Lee, do you have any other comments? Uh... No, I think you covered it. I mean, it's yeah. It, it, again, it all comes down. You know, we, we wouldn't be given this presentation if we didn't think that the 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 numbers made sense. Um, I think, Jill's, as you pointed out, you know, SLS printing does provide a cost friendly option. Um, you know, if you go beyond, uh, you know, the material cost and the cost of the machine, it's, you know, the reduction of labor, it's reduction in, uh, you know, man hours spent uh, to to produce these parts. So uh, there's a number of factors here, but I think, uh, I think you did a good job covering uh, <laughs> the, the key points as well. So I won't uh, belabor the point. Well, I think we were efficient. Uh, excellent job. Well, we'll start the Q&A a little early in this case. Um, 
We have a few already, but please do not hesitate if you have any questions for the speakers. Uh, just let me switch to me. Great. So if you have any questions for the speakers, we will just have, we'll just ask them in the, uh, at the bottom, but I'll start with the ones that have, I have already seen. Uh, the first of which is why would you say the SLS is useful for something like orthotics like what are the benefits of it over while well, you covered traditional but also over um other 3d printing technologies like sla yeah so we i mean so we talked about this a little bit i mean just the the ability to create functional parts that will actually you know work as they're they're designed to work um, I think that is the the main reason behind you know using the SLS technology versus you know say SLA or uh, or or FDM parts. Um, Jules, I you know I gave my thoughts on it. I don't know. Do you have any more thoughts on that as well? Yeah. Well, the um, you know like if we try to use let's say FDM or if we try to use SLA, the uh, the big challenge that you have is the supports that are there. Um, now, while you know there are efficient technologies to be able to remove those those supports, um, you know any kind of uh, witness that is left behind from the supports uh, will be a painful experience for the user. Um, so the um, the SLS come you know the part comes out of the machine quite ready to be used. You know, like a, the only reason that we do post processing on it is really to remove some of the surface roughness. But um, it's not, you know, the, the, there is no supports, there is no added um, um, elements that would be a painful experience for the user at the end, for the end user. So that's, I think, uh, one of the key criteria for SLS. Take a point. Okay, great. And then follow up. Well, not follow up, but another question. Uh, actually, that seems to be answered. But uh, Ibrahim is wondering, what is the cost of the machines? I'm assuming he's talking about the Podways machines. Yeah, so I mean, we're, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to dive into a, a cost calculation. I'd rather do that, uh, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So if uh, I will drop my, my email in the chat afterwards, let's talk afterwards, because as I mentioned before, the, we have two models. Um, you know, we have our S and our X. So, you know, it kind of depends on, you know, your production needs, um, you know, which model would actually work for you. And then there's a number of other, you know, accessories, maintenance contracts and everything that we can discuss. But let me, let me drop my chat or my email in the chat. Let's connect afterwards and uh, we can get, to, we can put together some numbers for you. Great. Thank you, and I'm not muted, excellent. Actually, the next question will be for Gilles, so I'll just already move it to you, which is how many insoles are you manufacturing per year, um, generally? Yeah, uh, so we've, uh, we've started manufacturing uh, insoles about, uh, I would say, four to six months ago. I actually don't have a date uh, per se in my head right now. Um, and we're, we're ramping up right now. So we're producing right now about 60 to uh, uh, 50 to 60 pairs a week. Uh, but we are ramping up. We're getting more labs into our customer base. Um, and and uh, you know, we're seeing customers that are sort of like trying to process, um, you know, going through the adoption process. So their ultimate, range, their ultimate objective is to have their own printer to be able to be autonomous and do it themselves. Uh, but you know they need to get familiar with the design software, with the scanning tools, with the um, with the options that are available. So they they choose to work with us uh, in the initial stage to really develop their process, uh, stabilize their process, and then afterwards uh, look at migrating towards their own production in the future. So uh, we have right now we're working with about three labs on a full time basis, and the objective is to grow that uh, regular. Uh, as much as we can. Okay, thank you. Um, now there's a few questions. Again, feel free to ask anyone you have in the Q&A. Uh, an additional question uh, is about, actually, Marcos asks, uh, would like to know about the skin contact test with PP.
So that isn't actually a question there. Yeah. No. Yeah. Lee, do you have any? Uh... So I don't have the information right in front of me. I know that, uh, so our supplier of the polypropylene material uh, has done some of this testing. Um, so let me, again, I hate to hate to say this again, but let me, Marcos, if you don't mind, I will follow up with you on this and, uh, and send the, uh, send the parts or send the information over to you. Great. Okay, well, moving on. Uh, so another question is, why do you think PP is growing? And what are the advantages compared to PA, uh, which has traditionally been used for this application? Well, yeah, I'll address the why it's growing and then Jill, if you want to take the rest of it. Yeah. So, I mean, I think obviously, you know, polypropylene is one of the most commonly used polymers in the world. So um, being able to produce uh, SLS parts in the same material that you're already using is huge. Um, and then, you know, even beyond that, I mean, the, the cost of the polypropylene material is uh, significantly less than uh, the nylon materials uh, today. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the recyclability, um, you know, you're, it's, it's, you can recycle the material at a better rate than you can with the, the PA or the, the nylon materials um, on the market today. So though all those factors combined, uh, you know, it, it's pretty clear to see why people are leaning towards, uh, towards polypropylene when you can get, you know, even some, uh, some better uh, mechanical characteristics from the, uh, the, the material as well. Yeah, and, the, and another thing that uh, some of the labs that we've worked with are, are, are looking at is that um, they find that the uh, polypropylene will have a better uh, form memory. So if you take the part and you twist it, it will come back to its shape a lot more than the, uh, uh, the, polypro uh, the, the uh, polyamide will do or the PA uh, nylon would do. So they, uh, they find that for the application, it is much better suited. Uh, sure, I mean, like PA is uh, is the first uh, product to be adopted, and, and, and you know, it, it, sometimes it's a question of uh, interest or desire or personality of the lab. Um, you know, some labs just like PA, right? They they, they want to work with PA. Uh, that's what they were introduced with, and uh, they can work with it. Uh, there's just a cost premium to working with PA compared to polypropylene, uh, and then if you can live with the functional differences you know the uh, um, the that are that are there between the two materials uh, you know um, you can live with it right uh, one of the key advantage of uh, poly polyamide versus polypropylene is the uh, you can dye polyamide much more much more easily than polypropylene uh, so we are working on solutions for for dyeing of polypropylene but uh, at this point uh, we don't get the same quality results of uh, you know, black parts and polypropylene that you will get with the PA material. Great. And actually, just because I saw it, there was the follow-up question to that. Uh, someone is asking, what is the durability of PA versus PP? So it's more a question of, uh, you know, if the part is being, you know, like a, deformed um, you know PA uh, I, I would say PP will come back to its shape or at least that's the experience that our uh, the labs that we're working with are saying uh, but the parts are pretty solid I mean they don't they don't break right they don't uh, I haven't seen a broken part yet yeah it takes a lot to break the uh, both of the materials well, uh, yeah, that's for sure. But okay, the next question um, actually is if you could expand on the different designs between US and Europe when it comes to the manufacturing of insoles and how does it impact 3D printing and that step? Yeah, Jules, I'll let you take that one because I know you've had a little bit more exposure and you can talk about some of the, uh, the benefits of the holes and, and whatnot. The, um, yeah, so, so the... Um, I mean, the, if you look at the, the way the adoption mechanism or the, the way that the, the adoption of 3D printing in uh, insoles is happening, in Europe, they, are, um, they seem to be 
re-engineering the process. They're, so, so they're not, um, well, or maybe start with America. America is saying, here's what we can do today with conventional machining or uh, fabrication process. Um, and they are looking at 3D printing and saying, can I produce the same product? So they, uh, so, so they essentially it's a, uh, it's a, uh, you know, j just changing, you know, so, so you're looking at your tool set and you're saying, instead of using my traditional uh, plaster mold or my traditional CNC, uh, I'm going to be using a 3D printer, but I want to produce the same product. So um, it, it looks, you know, the, the product is relatively the same. It's just a different way of producing it. Uh, the Europeans are taking it an approach approach more of optimizing the process along the way. Uh, so one of the things they're looking at is optimizing the weight, optimizing the breathability of the, uh, of, of the, uh, the orthotics. Um, so in doing that, they have, you know, they're, they're changing the ways that they look and, you know, taking advantage of, uh, of what the technology allows you to do. So uh, if you look at pictures, you, you'll see a lot of European insoles, which are full of holes in them. Uh, and that is there for breathability, for material reduction, for the, uh, um, and that's what we're seeing. Like the, the majority of the customers that uh, we've seen in, in Europe are changing that approach. They're not going with this, uh, replicating the insole. Um, and some of the advantages in terms of 3D printing, uh, the holes are there, so it facilitates the heat management inside the SLS machine. So that's. Uh, one of the key benefits. So you can probably increase your, uh, your packing ratio uh, in the SLS machine because of those, uh, those uh, channels that are available to be able to dissipate the heat. So uh, that is one of the uh, things that we will see uh, with the European approach versus North American one. Great, thank you. That was very interesting. And uh, next question is, what are the challenges in scanning CAD and printing for these insoles? And they're also wondering if it's possible to mention which software is used for scanning. Do you think that one or are you? I'll let you take that one again. Sorry. <laughs> but there are the, the thing is that there is a, there are several scanning solutions available out there. Um, now, the um, depending upon what software you are using to do the design, um, the, the the scan can either be used as is, or um, or you may have to go through a uh, uh, a conversion uh, software to be able to take the cloud of points and be able to convert it into usable data for let's say for fit for 360. Um, and uh, sometimes these, uh, these softwares will require you to pay for the conversion uh, of, the, of the file. And um, uh, the name, I don't have the name right now, it's in my head, but it, I just can't say it, say it out. Uh, but you know, the, there is a software that does that and like, you know, a dollar or two dollars per pair that you want to do, uh, where essentially they charge you to be able to take the, the cloud of points and be able to convert it to the data. And then afterwards you then take it into the CAD software and do the design. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, well then I will keep going in this case. One day we will have a question that you will answer Lee as well. Compared to MJF technology, so MOSJET Fusion, how would you explain the difference in terms of cost per part with SLS uh, 3D printed parts? Well, I could say right off the bat on that one. I mean, the, uh, you know, if we're talking cost per part, um, you know, we we also built in to our, our cost for part the uh, we built in the, the cost of the machine as well. So right off the bat, an easy way to explain a a large difference in the cost for part is the the machine cost. Um, you know, the cost of an MJF machine is is much more expensive than than a Broadway's machine. So I think simply right off the bat, that is the, uh, the easiest way to put it. And not not also neglecting the uh, the annual maintenance contract on the MJF machine, uh, which is quite also a significant portion, uh, and then also the consumables that are required to operate the MJF. Uh, 
So those are certain considerations that have to go down uh, in terms of uh, being able to exploit it. The other element that's also interesting is you can probably, for the price of one MJF machine, get two, uh, two Prodways machine inside, uh, in, inside your lab. Um, and I think you mentioned a bit earlier, but uh, definitely that it is um, an element of um, reliability, being able to look at uh, having two machines instead of one. Uh, it takes a little bit more space, but uh, you know, like you always have to maintain those machines. They you know, like uh, the preventative maintenance has to be done. Sometimes you know you it's not, you don't want it, but it breaks. Uh, and if one breaks, then you have the other one that can work. Uh, so the uh, reliability and uh, uh, you know being able to to stay up and running um, and being able to do it cost effectively that's what I find that is nice about the Prodway solution versus uh, the MJF solution. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we may not have built that into our cost comparison that we presented earlier, but that's, you know, the huge benefit having the redundancy and not, not having a machine that are, if you do have an issue on the machine, uh, you're not fully down. Uh, if you are able to get two products machines versus one of the, uh, the competitive machines. All right. Excellent. Thank you. And then I actually also had a couple of questions. We could go back to the insoles. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about what certification is necessary for these kind of orthotic devices, whether you need any uh, and what you have currently. I think that will mostly be for you. Yeah. Well, the, um, the, the, uh, the fabrication of orthotics can or cannot be regulated and you know certain states it is certain states it's not uh, certain provinces so the um so the uh the, there is a certain amount of uh regulation and also what will insurance companies refund to uh, to end users so um so we we are in the pro we are in the process of manufacturing the plastic insert part um so we do not do the end user part per se. Uh, we leave that job to the laboratory who uh, is owned and operated by uh, certified technicians and uh, that have the required uh, state or local uh, uh, licenses to be able to do the work. Uh, they do the diagnostic and the, uh, and the prescription and uh, they're integrated into the design of the uh, plastic insert uh, and they just transfer to us the uh, the fabrication of a plastic insert. So the uh, so the whole aspect of the regulation depends on the on the state in which you're in, where, where you're trying to provide the service, uh, and also uh, uh, the availability or the use of certified people to to do the design and uh, to do the uh, the final uh, the final integration of the uh, orthotics. Does that answer your question? Indeed, it does. Uh, you got it. Excellent. So then I have a couple of other questions from the audience and from myself. We have about five minutes. So if you do have any last questions, do be sure to put them in. Um, one question, which I think you guys touched upon earlier, but if you'd like to expand is, is there a single best polymer you would say for orthotics or is it more depending on the application? And what would you say are the advantages of one versus the other? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, uh, we keep going back to it, but you know, there, there's always the pressure on cost. Everybody's, uh, you know, it, it seems like as in as, as in any industry, it's always a race to the bottom. Um, you know, having a being able to to manufacture your parts uh, as cheap as you possibly can, and still have a part that works very well, and it is a huge huge benefit. So that's why we've been you know, more or less pushing the, the polypropylene as a, as a great solution for this. I mean, it's, uh, I'll, I'll hammer home these points all day. I mean, this is, uh, it's, it, it comes down to the, the cost of the material itself. Uh, it's, it's significantly cheaper to uh, purchase a, a kilo of uh, polypropylene versus a, a kilo of, uh, of uh, say, PA-12 or PA-11. Um, and then the recyclability, uh, again, it's, you can uh, use a better mixing ratio between uh, new and used powder when you launch a job. 
So uh, again, right there, you're saving, uh, the, the more use powder you can throw into a build, the, the better your, your cost per part is going to be. So that is, uh, it, it, you know, a huge part of it. And then the, uh, you know, again, going back to the, it's, it's already, polypropylene is already the material that is standard in the industry. Mm -hmm. So, you know, now having it available, I mean, it, it is, uh, a fairly recent, uh, you know, advancement in SLS printing, having the, the availability of polypropylene. Um, so having that available uh, now within the industry is is big. I mean, it's you're using the material that you're already uh, used to. Okay, no, thank you, Indy. That's a good point. Um, and actually, this might be a good question to end on. We shall see. Uh, but we would just ask, what is the future of this technology expanding to SMO, AFO, and other customized orthotics? Uh, because right now it appears to be for UCBLs or shoe inserts mainly. Well, I would say that uh, my experience in um, in uh, in using, like I would say, orthotics and prosthetics, uh, we have been working with prosthetics for at least the last, uh, I would say, uh, nearly six, seven years. Uh, we've manufactured several thousands of the prosthetics that are knee braces, for example, um, and knee braces, uh, elbow braces, uh, wrist braces. Um, so the, those have been around and been using SLS technology for a certain for a while, um, mostly in nylon. But um, and, and the reason that SLS is, is is good is because of the customization, being able to do the different sizes, being able to uh, and, and the uh, and the durability. So uh, we've been uh, we've been very very successful in the past uh, in terms of manufacturing those uh, those applications. And um, you know the foot, uh, for as, as funny as it may seem, the uh, the insole is probably the lowest cost, uh, lowest value add component where we can use three D printing, uh, but it is probably one of the biggest volume, and really the fact that we have a lower cost material now with polypropylene makes it uh, more cost effective or easier to get into that uh, to that application because now the price points are reaching the point where they make economic sense uh, and you know combined with also the fact that we're starting to have a significant labor shortage uh, in that application that you know that brings in that capability you know and the, the real barrier to entry really is the software right being able to have the design software that is effective and that you have the people that can do the design uh, rapidly and, and cost effectively uh, that is the, the that is still I wouldn't say it's not a barrier that's as high as it was, you know, three or four years ago, but you know, it's still not a, a slam dunk that uh, the solutions out there right now are are perfectly adapted and suited. We still need to simplify the process. Uh, you know, the, the, the solutions are there, but they can be simplified a little bit more, and that would be great. Yeah, and, and just to expand on that, I mean, you mentioned that we, are, yeah, you mentioned knee braces, but I mean, so the you know, the, the shoe inserts or insoles there, it's a, uh, it's a good place for us to get into right now. Um, but we do have customers that are producing AFOs, uh, already. So it's, we're already there. We're already in these other industries. We just, um, you know, right now we're, fo we're focused on, you know, the, the shoe insert itself as a, it's a, we see this as a, a great way to, uh, I guess more or less get the industry familiar with SLS printing and, and what is actually possible with this technology. Okay, and actually that's basically time. So I think I will say thank you to everyone for attending. If you have any additional questions, Lee, I don't know if you put your uh, email address in the chat, but feel free. I will drop it in right now. Perfect. Oli will send it, make sure to panels and attendees, and you can ask any further questions there. Uh, as I mentioned, this has been recorded, but it will be available later through Prodways. Uh, otherwise, I look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. And thank you once again, gentlemen. It was a pleasure.